<laughs> More awesome power. Okay. Let's look in our books. Are, are you recording now? Yes. Do it, man. Yeah, that was it. It's a mad, 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 mad world. <laughs> so we are on page fifty eight. And we're going to start talking about cells now. Living things are made from cells. That was discovered when microscopes were invented. It used to be people would look at a tree and they don't know what it's made of. It's, made of it's trees. not made of wood. Well, it is made of wood. It's not made of stones. It's not made, you know, it's they don't know what what the small things were that made objects up. You know, you could only see so small. You know, if you could put it real close to your eye and you couldn't see any smaller than that. Um, but once microscopes were invented, we figured out all living things are made from cells. And uh, you can see a little chart here. Um, they used to have the, the human was used to be naked in the old books, and now they've clothed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, interesting. Which one do you like better, Gage? Uh, the naked pictures. But it was a naked man, so, you know, didn't really would prefer the woman. Never mind. Let's, let's move on. Um, with, the, with the human eye, we can barely see the largest cells. A human egg cell is the largest human cell, and you can barely see that with the human eye. It's about the size of a grain of sand. Most cells are smaller than that, though. Most cells are uh, the size of uh, um, about a tenth or a hundredth the size of the human egg cell. And we have to have a microscope to see those. And the smallest cells of all are bacteria, prokaryotic cells. So small that you could fit a thousand of them in a single normal cell, or more than a thousand. And we'll take a look at those first. We'll look at those. Wait, so this says we can see a blue whale with a human eye? Yeah, you can see a blue whale with your eyes. Really? Wow. That's incredible. I'll have to try that. Yeah, it's about as long as this corn hall here. <laughs> have you ever seen a blue whale? Uh, not, not live, but I've seen a dead one. One hanging in, hanging in a in a museum like a model of one. I mean, it was pretty big. I could definitely see it though. Have you ever read one, one like Free Willy? Free Willy, Free Willy like on TV? Is he Free wasn't Willy a blue whale. Like killer whale. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. Come on. Wow. Yeah. Like that blue whale to jump <laughs> now we have a very strong type of microscope called an electron microscope that can see even better than our light microscopes. And you can see all the way down to the size of viruses and pre even proteins and amino acids. We can bear, only barely see the largest atoms with our electron microscopes. And small atoms, uh, or, or inside of an atoms like the protons, neutrons, electrons that we study, we can't really see those. Um, but they're getting better at imaging, and you might, you know, 50 years from now, you may be able to see protons, neutrons, and electrons. I doubt it, but you never know. They never thought we'd be able to see individual atoms, even just if you could barely see them, but you can. So they come up with different ways of seeing things. Now, the book on page 59 goes into a discussion of why cells are so small. I mean, you're made up of 80 trillion cells, so they must be really small. Why are they so small? Why not have big cells? Why, why not be made up of a thousand larger cells instead of 80 trillion real small cells? It's like you'd be like a thousand little pixels. Yeah, you'd be like pixels, yeah. Why not, though? Why not if the, if the cells can change shape, which they can, why not you wouldn't necessarily have to look like pixels. It could be, they could be curved surfaces. There's a reason, though. There's a, there's a physical reason that cells have to be small. 
And it's something called surface area to volume ratio. It's a mathematical thing. And let's break that term down, surface area to volume ratio. Really what it means is surface area divided by volume. Have you had a ratio in math before? Yes. A ratio is just a fraction. So what we're talking about is surface area to volume, the fraction of surface area over volume. Needs to be a, this, this fraction needs to be a high number. Needs to be high. Surface area to volume ratio it has to be high for cells to survive. Why is that? Well, what is surface area? Surface area is the area on the outside. Like this globe, this is its surface. Everything I can touch on this globe, that's the surface of the globe. And it has a certain amount of area. You could measure the area if you knew the proper equations, which we all don't, and I do. <laughs> anyway, um, you could figure out how much area that is, how much stuff I'm touching here. And that's the surface area. And what is the volume? Y'all know? What's the volume yeah. of this sphere? It's what's inside. How much is inside? And for a cell, a cell has to have a lot of surface to feed its volume. Cells take in all their food through their surface. So there's volume, there's stuff in there that needs to be fed. It needs food, it needs water, it needs oxygen. It needs stuff. The volume needs to be supported from the outside. Also, the cell needs to give off wastes. And it can only give off wastes through its surface. So surface is very important for a cell. Are you with me, Ellie? Mm -hmm. Surface is good, right? You see what you're saying? Not me. <laughs> now, which has more surface? One four centimeter cube or 64 one centimeter cubes? Just look at them. Which has more surface? 64 and There's more surface here. Every little cube has some surface that can take in stuff and give off stuff through the surface. The big cube only has surface on the outside. There's no surfaces on the inside. So the volume that's in the big cube, there's the same amount of volumes in both of these. But this configuration has a lot more surface area than this, than this configuration. So we would say that for the 4 centimeter cube, the surface area to volume ratio is low. And for the 64 1 centimeter cubes, the surface area to volume ratio is high because there's more surface area for the 64 1 centimeter cubes. And they've already they've gone and calculated it for you. For this one, for the 1 4 centimeter cube, there's a 1.5 to 1 surface area to volume ratio. For the 64 1 centimeter cube, there's a 6 to 1 surface area to volume ratio. And when you get down to the size of cells, the surface area to volume ratios are like a thousand to one. There's lots of surface for a little, just a little bit of volume. And that means that cells have plenty of ways to take stuff in and get rid of waste. They can do it very easily. Does that make sense? That's why cells are small. And if a cell starts growing and gets real big, its surface area to volume ratio will be a lot lower. And so guess what the cell does once it gets big enough? Split. It divides into two. And that gives it more surface. And so cells will never grow over a certain size. I think we're trying, like, genetically enhance the size of a cell. So that we get some, like, massive, like, football-sized cell. It wouldn't have enough surface, though. It would die from it. It would drown in its own waste. So it's a tough way to go. We're gonna find a way to extract waste from it. Yeah. yeah, somehow you'd have to you know, one yeah, thing cells do to increase their surface area is they make their surface like this. That would give it more surface. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Instead of being flat if you put little extensions. 
That's like if you think of a towel. You know, there's those lame brown towels that we have in the lab that are just flat. And they won't absorb much water a little bit. And then there's the nice towels that your mom buys at home that have little bumps on them. And they'll absorb a lot more because they have more surface. Just lame more flat towels bad, area. bumpy towels good. <laughs> And if you really want to dry yourself off, you go get a, a bath towel that has thousands of little hairs on it. You ever notice that? Those will absorb a whole lot. Those are great. <laughs> so that's surface area to volume ratio. Now, there's a cool special reading section on page 60 and 61 about microscopy. If you want to grow up and be a scientist and look at microscopes all the time, and by the way, our first lab next week, we're going to use, learn how to use the microscopes that we have. We'll be using them off and on throughout this class. Um, we're going to be using a light microscope. Are we going to see cells? One like this. Oh, yeah, we're going to look at cells. Here's what an amoeba looks like under a, a pretty good, that's a pretty good light microscope there. That's a good picture. When we look at amoebas, I would be surprised if you saw it that nicely. But anyway, uh, that's what they look up at under a light microscope. Look what they look like under a scanning electron microscope. That's a cool microscope, man. And one thing about electron microscopes is they can see way smaller things than this amoeba. That amoeba, like let's say you wanted to say, hey, what is that little white dot there? With an electron microscope, you could blow that white dot up. You could see what it is. <laughs> so this kind of goes over microscopes. And I remember when I was at Georgia Tech, we had a phase contrast microscope in the biology lab there, which was real expensive. It was like a fifty thousand dollars scope. Really? And yeah. And uh, you know, you had to only the grad students could work on it. The lowly undergrads weren't allowed. They took pictures like this, and it kind of gives you shading and that kind of thing. So there's all different types of uh, microscopes, and we're going to look at some cells and use the microscope. Here's the inventor of the microscope. Is it Mr. Microscope? Yeah, his name's Robert Hooke. Oh. <laughs> and he put a couple lenses together, and he said, hey, if you put two lenses next to each other, it makes things bigger. That's kind of neat. He looked at a few things, and... He built the first microscope. And this is one, he took a, some bark from a tree and looked at it under the microscope, and he saw little openings, little holes. And he said, man, those look like cells. You know, like prison cells? Like someone would be kept in a cell? <laughs> those look like little prison cells. And so that's where the name cell came from. <laughs> he actually wasn't referring to prison cells. He was referring to rooms that monks live in, which are also called cells. Um, but it's the same It's the same word, prison cell and monk cell. They live in little rooms. So that's where the word cell came from. We still have it. Now, the simplest, smallest cells are prokaryotic cells. Look on page 62. Prokaryotic cells are very small, very simple. They're the first organisms that existed on the earth. If you look in a rock that's 4 billion years old, 3.9 billion years old, and you crack it open, you can find fossils of little creatures that look like this. And so they were around a long time ago. And the cells are very simple and very tiny. And if they're round, we call them coccus cells. And if they're spiral, we call them spirillum or spirochete cells. And if they're kind of rod-like, we call them bacillus cells. And these are, these are bacteria in another group called archaea. And the bacteria and the archaea, they're all over the place. You don't realize it right now. One square inch of your skin is covered by about a hundred million of these things. Every square inch of your skin is covered by these things right now. They're very plentiful. They're floating around in the air. They're on the surfaces of the decks. They're all over the plants. 
They're everywhere. You don't even know they're there because they're so small. Does Alps and um, Likewise products like actually like kill them? Yes. Uh huh. Oh. Like Lysol? Yeah. Yeah. You can kill these things, put them in bad environments, put a lot of alcohol on them, heat them up real hot, they'll die. But they'll come back. <laughs> and like wash, just washing yourself with soap won't kill the ones on your skin. Um, burning yourself, catching your skin on fire would do it, but I wouldn't advise it. <laughs> the bacteria that are on your skin don't hurt you, and you'll never be lonely. Think about that. <laughs> you always have friends living with you. If you talk to them, people might think you're kind of weird. That's what they call schizophrenia. Yeah, but they're there. And here's a close-up of one. This is one of the ones that looks like a rod. And uh, it, uh, it's a bacillus. And you can see all of its parts there. I'm almost out of time. Um, let me just go over them real quick, and you can read about the rest of this tonight. It has hairs on, often has hairs called fimbriae on the outside of it. It's, it's used to stick to things. It's got a gel-like outer coating called a glycocalyx that also helps it stick to things and helps protect it. It's got a cell wall that's really tough. It's like a fence that gives it, that kind of holds its shape. That cell wall is like a chain link fence. And it's got a plasma membrane that's made of those phospholipid, those fat molecules. Remember those? And that helps determine what gets in and out of the cell. It's got DNA, that's the stringy stuff right there, um, just floating around inside of it. gives it its instructions. It's got ribosomes, which help make proteins. The little dots are little protein factors. This inclusion body is a bubble that holds stuff. And the sex pillus. Yes, bacteria can have sex with one another. They insert their sex pillus into a neighboring bacteria and inject a little bit of DNA. And then they go their separate ways. Sometimes they never even call each other after. No second date. No second date. And they're all the same sex. There's not like a male and female. They all have the sex pills. So the equipment is the same on all the bacteria. But, you know, it's a rough life, but <laughs> One thing they can do is they can reproduce fast, like crazy. If you've ever had an infection, you know, you scrape yourself and your mom goes, put some spray on that, you're going to get an infection. And you go, why, why do you talk in that tone? That's very <laughs> That's to kill the bacteria that might be growing inside your body. And if they grow and multiply inside your body, that can kill you. Before the age of antibiotics, half of people died from infections. Half of us wouldn't have even made it to this age because uh, they, there's so many bacteria, so much bacteria. Now we 